Quiver, New Weapons for Thought, a post elysian political project that takes thinking to be an instrument of combat. Unapologetically queer, feminist, anti-capitalist, and abolitionist. So we're so excited uh, today to talk about conspiracy through a number of theorists whom we might broadly read within a sort of wider nihilist or pessimist tradition that would, let's say, be friendly towards anarchism, but are sort of not anarchists themselves, but sort of carry on an even wilder spirit, remembering figures within the history of the 19th or even middle 20th century who are more attached to the avant-garde, like surrealists, people whose nicknames were the wild this or the crazy that. And I think that that is a sort of energy that often gets lost, especially with the historians of anarchism, like to tie it to syndicalism and you know, 15th treatment of the Spanish Civil War or some sort of factional dispute within some sort of uh, anarchist unionism. So today we're just so excited to talk about conspiracy and myth. Um, and we have someone presenting the text for us today. So I'm just gonna hand it over. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, that um, the most recent release, The Sacred Conspiracy, that's on Contagion Press, if anybody's interested. And Contagion uh, is a super small shop. It does really beautiful work. The actual physical stuff they put together is very cool. I ordered a copy myself too. Um, and they're also nice. They'll give you a 20% discount if you put some cash in an envelope rather than paying online. So good good people and, and good output for sure. Um, yeah, and, and thank you. And thank you, Dana, for uh, <laughs> inviting somebody to present something a little bit different. And I know that we talked about, you know, maybe egoism or something along those lines. And I think the writing piece is gonna address that very well because Laura Riding was an egoist, uh, but kicking off with, uh, with the tie and the sacred conspiracy. Um, it seemed like this was a good starting point and something that's going to be, it's fairly easy to, to tie in to D&G and specifically like anti-Oedipus, uh, given the kind of psychoanalytic bent of that and the Schraber angle for sure. So religion comes into it, conspiracy comes into it, uh, as well as schizoanalysis and how those two tie together. Um, but to roll through the sacred conspiracy first, uh, not gonna spend time really on the three quotes by Saad Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. Uh, those are fairly obvious, um, really kind of writing off politics immediately. And this is why Bataille falls well outside the pale of most other folks at, at his time that were politically active. Um, he wanted to be a communist in a lot of ways, and I'm sure like Gustavo, you might have come across this, but he was always trying to engage with communists and they never wanted anything to do with him <laughs> be because his ideas were far too out there. Um, and he wound up kind of finding that home like with more with the surrealist movement uh, because that's what made sense. Like the, the whole absurdist angle of his writing, uh, of his poetry, and that he really has in, in, uh, in a lot of common with writing that he certainly uses what she would call like the individual unreal. So he's not trying to create something that you can relate to all the time or that you can contextualize yourself. He's speaking from himself and his unique place, uh, which is very liberatory, but unfortunately not very uh, communistic. Uh, it can make it challenging for people to relate to because if they don't if they don't recognize that, you know, by being mine, myself and being egoistic, that I'm encouraging them to do the same, uh, there can be seen like a lack of connection. So while being aggressively antisocial, uh, kind of in the presentation, it's not antisocial in the sense that we should all be recognizing this in each other and, and sharing that value, like recognizing our difference. So getting into the text to start, um, not going to spend too much time, uh, you know, on that first paragraph. He kind of has it in like little couplets here. It's very aphoristic uh, where he says, what we started must not be confused with anything else, cannot be limited to the expression of a thought and still less to what is rightly considered. <clears throat> I just lost my page. It's necessary to produce and to eat. Many things are necessary. There's still nothing. And so is, is with political agitation. So essentially, we have to go beyond thought and art. Uh, there, there's not an ability to wrap our heads around any sort of totality or any sort of unity. Uh, there's no sort of rational analysis that we can make that's going to contextualize the game that we're playing uh, in a political sense. Uh, 
when he uh, when he says a couple paragraphs further down, we are ferociously religious, and then immediately follows that with what we are starting is a war. It's a break with uh, it's it's basically a break with what we could call consensus reality in this day and age. Uh, you know, we can say that we're in the post truth era right now. Uh, Bataille was already living in the post truth era uh, in his writing and in his work, as were the rest of the surrealists. Uh, they recognize that in the ideas of the Enlightenment ideals of, you know, rationalism and humanism, there was ultimately nothing but fascism at their logical end. Uh, we often, I think these days, tend to think of fascism, uh, and we've discussed this in this group before, uh, rather than really a political movement, it is more of an aesthetic. It's an aesthetic that we tend to find ourselves opposed to. Uh, but what it does offer people is a sense of belonging, a sense of group identity, uh, a sense of connection to place uh, and an idea of community and shared self-interest uh, or self-interest of the group that is. Uh, the only way to destroy that, that fascistic kind of core in Bataille's sense uh, is to obliterate all ideas of that rationality or that shared space uh, to take the head off as he does in the example of acephala that he's using for the, uh, the actual, the God but un-God I should say, of the sacred conspiracy uh, that they are worshiping here. So it's going beyond politics because pi politics is, uh, it's eating and shitting. It's brushing your teeth. It's things that you do every single day. It's those kinds of basic interactions and machinations that you'll ultimately find no end in because they've obviously got rational conclusions, but they don't truly tie anything together. Uh, there, there's only another version of it is what comes after. There's no, nothing revolutionary about a revolution. You simply get the next iteration followed by the next, followed by the, the next to its rational end. And he goes a little bit more into this. So beyond his statement of what we are starting as a war, it's the time to abandon the world of the civilized and its light. It's too late to be reasonable and educated, which has led to a life without appeal. So shunning completely, you know, all the systems of education, the systems of teaching reason, the systems that reproduce over and over this consensus reality in whatever form it's going to be, but ties casting all of that aside, all of that aside. Uh, he goes further into that in what he calls the world of educated vulgarity. So making us less human through the act of education, taking away the beauty, smashing it all, like taking away the opportunity for the absurd or the new uh, through reason and through education. Down further, he who tries to ignore or misunderstand ecstasy is an incomplete being whose thought is reduced to analysis. Uh, and that's interesting because I started thinking about this in terms of psychoanalysis, obviously, uh, and kind of the tie back to the beginning of Anti-Oedipus. And when we look at the Schreber case, I've been reading a little bit of Lacan recently, which has me thinking about Schreber in a slightly different angle. But then that got me interested in Schreber a little bit more. So I was reading Schreber's memoirs. And the way that Schreber descri describes uh, his psychosis in his memoirs is it's not so much a, it's mental, but he sees it more as religious. He almost talks of himself as if he's a theologian rather than, a, rather than an analyst or rather than a psychologist. So he's viewing all of this as real. He, he is truly going to be a, he's become woman. He's going to be the mother essentially of God's child. He finds himself to be such a valued piece of this universe that he is, uh, he's caught the eye of God. God is attracted to him. It's the ultimate narcissism. But thinking about that theologically, one can also wonder, is this delusion any different from the delusion that a God exists? Is this any different from the delusion that we are able to speak to a God through a human intermediary? or any other ritual that we take part in. Uh, and I started thinking about that along the lines of say, everything from the most uh, almost secular versions of transcendental meditation, uh, all the way back to Sanskrit prayers and Buddhism, uh, or if you even think about uh, Egyptian religion or all the way back to the Sumerians. What's the difference in any of those delusions? And what's the difference between schizophrenia and religion at that point? It's really a theological study. And I think Bataille kind of ties into this core uh, which has a very, I find a nihilistic seed at its, at, its, at its center because it gives you this idea that the world is not real, it's all mythic. And if the world is mythical, the world is ultimately religious, well then that religion is of our own creation as Schraber's was. Uh, it's not shared any more so than we choose to share. Um, 
And by doing that, we essentially, we can break down rationalism that way because your myth is completely different from my myth potentially, but neither is more real than the other. Uh, so he starts to talk about life and death here, which again, thinking of, uh, thinking of Schreber, Schreber imagined everyone around him to basically be dead and going through the motions because he was the one engaging with God. So the world was essentially a bunch of, uh, you could say zombies in most cases or empty bodies or empty souls relating to him. Uh, and Bataille goes here to say thought that does not have a dead fragment as its object has the inner existence of flames. So meaning that we need to remove the dead world. We need to remove, remove the real if we're to create anything new. If we're to open up the possibility for impossibility, then we have to take the dead out first and everything of this world and of reality is essentially dead. The consensus is dead, politics are dead. Uh, what we call rationality is completely dead. And then further, and again, I start thinking Schraber here, it's useless to respond to those who are able to believe in the existence of this world and who take their authority from it. So, he goes through the, the first when he's working with Fleshig. Schraber is able to basically cast off uh, some of his ideas and get himself back into the world. He's acting again as a judge and a magistrate. He's able to do his job. Um, but he can't hold on to that because there's something greater. Like there's something greater than the real that draws him back again into his delusion. Um, and I think Bataille is really inviting us to dive into that delusion and to not make a delineation between that delusion and reality to recognize that each is as real as the other and neither is any different. And then getting to the figure uh, of Acephala that he ends up coming to, and he describes it in detail as, man has escaped from his head just as the condemned man has escaped from his prison. He's found beyond himself, not God, who's a prohibition against crime, but a being who is unaware of prohibition. Beyond what I am, I meet a being who makes me laugh because he is headless. This fills me with dread because he is made of innocence and crime. He holds a steel weapon in his left hand, flames like those of the sacred heart in his right. He reunites in the same eruption, birth and death. He's not a man, he's not a God either. He is not me, but he's more than me. His stomach is a labyrinth in which he has lost himself, loses me within him, and in which I discover myself as him, in other words, as a monster. So this can be, tr I know that this has been read often as kind of, uh, destruction of God by man then creating like the overman because everything in the sacred conspiracy comes back to a very Nietzschean sort of a core uh, that's very much at the core of a lot of what Bataille is talking about uh, but in his use of the word monster at the same time uh, it harkens to an idea of like the unmensch so the non-man something much more animalistic due to the destruction of that uh, that rationality so considering that if our project is going to be some sort of a whether we want to say a social or a personal upheaval, we can't get to that place through our heads. We have to get the, to that place through a completely open way of thinking, uh, which again is tying it into you know, schizoanalysis and back into anti-Oedipus. You remove the head, then you open yourself to those flows. So desire becomes open at that point. Your plane becomes open at that point. Uh, and all possibilities are open because you've removed rationality, you've removed constraint, you've removed the interpretation, uh, and we no longer need to contextualize ourselves on a larger basis. Um, and I guess, what does that mean from an organizational perspective? I think that's where the sacred conspiracy comes in. It, it's the idea of a, almost like an individualistic religiosity, like a personal mythology that's shared among this small group. It's, it's the conspiracy and it's the conspiracy against reality, against the real, uh, because that in, ultimately is going to be the only way that we can make any sort of, I, I'd hate to call it progress because that wouldn't be what it is. But if we're going to make an escape, then it's really uh, the real that we need to reject as opposed to the systems that we view within it. We can't contextualize that way anymore. And the last small section, uh, he goes in the last paragraph talking about uh, sitting in the house and, and writing all this with uh, Andre Masson there, who's obviously a surrealist, um, the artist who created a cephala there too in, in that drawing. So they're at Montserrat, they're at the mountain. And this entire thing is imbued with the very, uh, it's the earth, it's the sun, it's the mountain. It's all of these elemental pieces kind of clashing together to create what they're actually building here with the sacred conspiracy. Uh, it's something beyond man. 
it's something beyond what we consider the real or is constructed. So it's from the earth. Uh, he talks about flames coming up from the ground around a cephala. He talks about uh, this idea that the mountain gives birth, that the earth gives birth, just like the sun does through excrement. Um, and that further kind of ties back in. Hang on. What we're reading, say, in the first uh, the first three sections of Antioedipus. So earlier in Bataille's writing uh, in the piece on the solar anus, he sums this up, I think, really nicely when we think about the idea of absurdity for escape. He says, it's clear that the world is purely parodic. In other words, the each thing seen is the parody of another or is the same thing in deceptive form. Uh, and this to me can be tied as well into the idea of difference and repetition. We're only, we're choosing to see what we want to see. We're creating totalities where in fact no totalities exist. So we're seeing difference over and over and over. It's our sense of contextualizing them and that consensus reality, again, that's forming them into the, the solidified, like as you know, Sterner would say, like reified objects that we then lift above ourselves. And further down, he, he talks about, uh, everyone's aware that life is parodic and it lacks an interpretation. Thus, lead is the parody of gold. Air is the parody of water. The brain is the parody of the equator. Coitus is the parody of crime. Gold, water, the equator, the equator, or crime can each be put forward as the principle of things. And if the origin of things is not like the ground of the planet that seems to be the base, but like the circular movement that the planet describes around a mobile center, then a car, a clock, or a sewing machine can equally be accepted as the generative principle. So going back again, you've removed the head. There's a, there is no fixed center. Everything's in constant movement and we can re recontextualize from any area. Uh, and what this means for politics in the sense of the sacred conspiracy is going to be that we're, we're, we're looking at this from a standpoint of truth, uh, which is ultimately a consensus truth. It's a social truth. Uh, and there's no way to get beyond that. We're always going to find that sticking point and that sticking point ultimately uh, what Bataille sees when we go down a, a socialist or a, a communistic route, or even in some ways a capitalist route, is going to be that core of fascism. Because all truths that are based on some sort of a fixed center, uh, they're ultimately going to end up in tyranny and we have no way of escaping that by thinking in those tyrannical terms. Our, our heads are the source of tyranny, our reason is the source of tyranny. And I believe that's most of what I've got for my notes. Uh, I mean, it definitely brought up some other thoughts about Deleuze and Guattari and the idea about disjunctions being foundational. So that there is a, there exists really only contradiction in some sense uh, that all unities and harmonies are, are false constructs uh, and going to be problematic when we're trying to build, uh, build any groups in that sort of a way. Um, And that Laura Riding talks about this a whole lot, uh, but really that when we deal with things that are our contradictions or that when we, when we engage in politics and see something as a non-option, uh, it's ultimately because of a dualism of our own construction. And that dualism is what creates the contradiction rather than the other way around. Uh, there really is no contradiction if we consider that in any given moment, kind of like aphorisms, they can be true in any given moment, yet not in all, all moments. And I'm going to catch up on the chat. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Josh. Uh, thank you. It was a great, um, well, I'm going to start and I hope uh, somebody can, you know, you're going to form your questions. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for proposing the text and also thank you for, for this wonderful presentation of uh, the first text of Bataille. And um, what can I say? I mean, I love the way that you have connected this text with uh, Andy Oedipus as well and Schreber. And I think you also nailed this um, theological theological aspect in a 
theological, theological in the greatest sense. I think it was um, a great analysis that she did. And this is a very open text. And um, I think it's useful for many interesting interpretations. And I'm looking forward to listening to, to your thoughts. Um, if I were to connect it uh, with uh, the lesson that I read, I, I would also I would also highlight this um, as a far the headless um, 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 uh, the headless picture, and maybe also with uh, the speciality machine. Uh, a head that, that holds the brain and the intellectual, but also a face that uh, consolidates the subject. Again, going back to, to the ways that we can use to escape the signifiants and subjectification and organization. And I think somehow there it is connected also with the, the organization part. Thank you, thank you very much. I, uh, Dana, I didn't hear. I didn't hear you. There was a noise on the, on the line. But Asafal, uh, you were connected to, connecting it to DNG with a blank machine. That's what I got. Uh, the speciality machine. The, okay, got it. Got it. The visagete. Thank you. So interestingly, uh, I guess in speaking of Asafala, the the labyrinth in the stomach uh, would almost have more to do with the face in that sense, because that's where the subject uh, is created and destroyed. So there's another piece called the labyrinth by Bataille that ties into this more, uh, but the idea of ipsaity and that being almost, he's been called the philosopher of excrement. That's kind of a, a fun name for Bataille <laughs> because derogatorily, you know, he produces nothing but shit, some people would say. Um, but for him as well, there's a almost like a, how how would you say this best? I guess that you digest yourself in that place. Uh, so being becomes digested. Uh, you you it's an a, an unbecoming is how Laura writing I guess would put it. So rather than sub further subjectifying yourself or becoming a subjectivity, uh, it's the destruction of that fixed subjectivity to create that openness. Uh, and I, I think, again, that's it's a great example of where we can get more out of these readings where I often say to people like, you know, read theory as poetry or read theory as fiction, uh, but also read theory as theology. Because this is a very, it's a very open idea. Uh, and I think that that's why often, I've, I've actually been listening to some Christian theologians recently talk about symbolism quite a bit. And some of, I think my interest in that is that Bataille has a similar sense of possibility and openness that allows for non-material solutions to what seem to us to be material problems. And one of those problems really is the creation of the subjectivity in the first place, because that gives us a kind of, uh, it gives us a, a grounding in ob objectivity and rationality uh, by being subjects that we almost need to remove to remove that constraint. So yeah, I, th I think the stomach is almost more what, uh, from Deleuze and Guattari, you would, you would associate the face with in some ways. Well, I, I guess I wanted to, to start off very quickly to say thank you again, Josh. Um, uh, I really enjoyed your, uh, your reading of how the, this interpretation of ultimately uh, we as human beings want to be ruled at some level, but I would, um, I would say that's not true, at least in my experience. Um, if you come into a system that's already full of hatred and um, destruction, then why would you want to be ruled from that system? So I think what, at least what I'm looking for, are philosophers that want to find threads of finding unity in that other, otherness, um, because the system can't be corrected if you're not a part of the system, even no matter how educated you are. And on the rationale that education also is a way to, to uh, disempower the educated, uh, I think my thought about that is that if you really don't understand the maps of culture, 
and you can't really fathom what the language means to you if it's always against you. And every law is about uh, disempowering you and everyone that you love, then education actually makes you react a little bit quicker. So you won't get shot in the street, right? So the way that I see a lot of uh, culture is that as long as you're aware and, you, and you're a little bit ahead, uh, and that doesn't mean you can win, you just won't die. So I like the idea of, you know, life and death, eating and uh, shitting, right? Well, I think life is more than that. So I think, and maybe Dana and Andrew can speak about that, but at least a long history in the arts is that when the way that I was taught the arts <laughs> is that you're trying to find your own individuality and in truth. And that, and depending on who you are, that leads to very interesting confrontations in culture and power. And each one of those confrontations is a kind of a philosophical um, understanding of what's really happening to you and your community. And the small little community creates a little discourse. I think what we're doing here, you know, we're just f confronting different sides of something that we can't understand. Uh, and I think a lot of uh, uh, going to the second reading, which I won't go to now, is that um, it, it's very clear that if we want to find independence, um, education is an indoctrination. Uh, identifying as, uh, as part of a larger group is indoctrination. Uh, but my question to the group would be, how do you survive? if you don't at least wear, or you're in drag, uh, another type of culture or value system. Um, so anyway, those are, my, those are my initial thoughts. But thank you, Josh. It was a very, very uh, good reading for this week. Brandon's got a hand up. Yes, I do. Thanks again, Josh. This was, uh, these were both really good readings. I, uh, I enjoyed your... Uh, what you were saying about them. Um, one thing that I noticed about them, I was wondering if you could like talk a little bit about this, is how the tie sort of creates or like links this development to the head towards like the development of like a sense of necessity that exists in the universe. And I think it connects with the writing piece really well in that she talks about the myth and like the baby's de decision to basically continue the myth, not for themselves, but for the responsibility or the for the for the taking responsibility for the other babies around them. Uh, and so I guess I was wondering what you thought about that and like how that connects to what's going on with this. Yeah, for sure. I, I think uh, so. the head piece of it is maybe a very human trait. And, and I I'll, I'll honestly might just say like the, the burden of consciousness that we spend a lot of time rationalizing things based on, on utility. So we know that we need to eat, we know that we need to survive, but we'll say, I'm not gonna do that because that's going to endanger my survival. When in matter of fact, it's not. Like we could take a lot of risks that none of us choose to take. Um, that's always a political question, right? How far are you willing to go? And I think back to what Gustavo was saying, it's funny where like Pataya even says, a world that cannot be loved to the point of death in the same way that a man loves a woman represents only self-interest and the obligation to work. So if you're not willing to die, then, you know, what the hell are you living for is, is in some ways what Bataille is saying. Like a world that's not worth dying for, he has really no interest in. Just the same way he has no interest in food at that point. Who cares? Like you're going to feed yourself to continue. That's not something you need to think about. Um, writings piece, I think, really gets at the heart of, of one of the major matters, which the myth in the broadest sense is the myth of permanence. So we assume that all things are the way that they are in a fixed state when things are continually moving all the time. Uh, I like to think of it in, in terms of like the Buddhist notion of subtle impermanence. So you imagine uh, you fire and you, you have a bow and arrow and you shoot an arrow through the air. And as it's moving through the air, it's existing in all of these individual moments. If you're to stop it at any one point, like there's that arrow. Like this arrow over here is no longer the same arrow. You know, there's, it's not the same thing as a moose that arc. 
just like we're not the same in any given moment. And, and I'm not saying a specific period of time, but whenever we choose to observe. So in this observable moment, like I'm me, uh, I walk out the door, I'm a different me, still the same version. So the problem isn't the change. The problem is, is uh, our refusal to accept it because we want stability. We want something that we can feel safe with and we feel safe uh, because we've been taught to, we feel safe when things are stable and fixed and nothing's moving around us. So while Bataille suggests uh, that small piece I was reading from the solar anus, like where he's basically saying, choose whatever object you want and your universe in turn rotates around that object. Shift the object and you have a completely new universe. Uh, writing is kind of saying the same thing, but we're all in this agreement where in order to keep ourselves fed and to maintain that stability, we need to we need all be in agreement on what that consensus truth is going to be and to take part in that process and place value into that process in order to perpetuate it. Uh, and in some ways for her, that that comes with a very similar to Bataille, like the removal of the head at that point, uh, the devaluing of rationality, uh, the recognition that this agreement isn't beneficial to any of us. Um, she takes a sort of a different route with the myth because she's using myth in an almost negative way, like it's almost pejorative the way that she's using it which is, if you read more of her work, you'll realize it's kind of a, it's a play, like it's a joke. She's playing it both ways. Like she's recognizing the, the myth is real, but then saying that like, oh, but it's not, you know, you write it off at the same time. Um, but that's where I see the removing the head and the mythic is, is both of them are saying like what we're calling rational isn't, like it doesn't actually make sense. Uh, you can say we don't have a problem with climate change. Like we have a pro we have a problem with uh, our attachment to the climate in its current state, yeah. right? Exactly. Is to hold it perpetually as it is in stasis doesn't happen because nothing in nature remains in homeostasis for any period of time. Mm -hmm. If you feel that it does, it's because we've only been here for a blink of an eye, but it's, it's more a matter of perspective than it is about reality. So I was curious because we're about a hundred years on now from when these texts were written and it was like clearly a very different time for anarchism and then in the ensuing hundred years there was this sort of brutal like repression of it especially here in the united states followed by it feels like the dominant like uh system of either government or economics found a way to try and incorporate more and more of that like unstructured stuff into a greater structure so i guess what do you see as sort of the the relevance of these pieces to today in the situation right now I see the relevance in, in being that like we've all been so enclosed and not just by the government, but by, I'm speaking for anarchists, I guess, and I don't really, I guess I'm politically an anarchist. I don't consider myself philosophically an anarchist or anything, but we, um, I kind of distance myself at the moment, actually, but uh, anarchism's enclosed itself, I, as I think any ideology is going to do. But I think part of that enclosure uh, has really been through a, a political framing and a strictly socio-political framing. And that's what I think Bataille writing, uh, egoism in general, um, kind of brings, brings to the mix is that it's not only social and political, it's also a, a psychological inquiry. Because this idea that we're all, uh, it's, it's like really the economic idea that we're all these rational units, you know, that we're all out there maximizing our utility in the world. We all know that that's utter bullshit. Like we, we rarely really know what we want for lunch on any given day. So we're not all acting in our best interests in some sort of an objective way. Uh, and if we don't take that into account, then how can we develop theory and practice that are going to do anything? So it's like, from my perspective, uh, there, there's one author, for instance, who I think is an amazing thinker and wrote one of the best recent books on theory uh, regarding police in the state, um, Tom Nomad. And he's got a book, uh, one is called The, Ma uh, the Master's Tools, mm -hmm. and it speaks specifically about how to uh, potentially con confront police on the street in an activist kind of a setting, or a direct action kind of a setting, insurgent kind of a setting. And he's got another called Toward an Army of Ghosts, which is just a brilliant theory book. At the same time, uh, you know, this is someone who's all about black block and, you know, the modern forms of insurgency and protest which those two things don't make any sense to me. Because if you can recognize that police are an attempt for the government to essentially uh, project, right? Governmental power across space and time. Yeah. 
if we think about it as maybe like Bataille would, we'd say that's absurd. That doesn't work at all. Why would power can't be everywhere all at once? Like all of us right now can revolt in the rooms that we're sitting in and no one can do anything about it. But then we still, I, I'm going to say we again here, like as anarchists still get this idea that we should get in a giant group out in the street and, you know, go make a mess of things, which is the exact way that you can be completely enclosed, right? And subdued. Like, why would you have a thousand people in the same place at the same time anyways? If you wanted, if you want to create chaos, send a thousand people out to a thousand different places and do your destruction if that's what you want. So I really think that there's got to be some kind of a psychological element to it. Um, I think it's got to be something more than simply, you know, socio-political discourse. Uh, if anarchists or anyone else for that matter uh, wants to propose solutions that are going to work in the current environment, I think this stuff's more relevant now than ever. Uh, we feel more open because of the openness that's been brought into, say, the workplace or our ability to move, all of these other things. But we've paid the price of having a surveillance state for that, that luxury, right? right? So, yeah, you have more freedom, but now you're also more connected. So you feel more free to, like when people talk about the inter internet being anarchists, like that's just stupid to me. Like all of the infrastructure is owned by corporations. So like, how is any of it anarchist, right? But it gives you that feeling that you can organize with people. But my, my question is always like, to what ends? So I, I guess the personal project for me is kind of like the liberation of the mind, you know, cutting off your own head without having to do it literally. Yeah, trying to find a way to escape that enclosure. Right, and, and to not reproduce more of the same. Because I think most of the repression, it's almost like, it, it's, it's a morality play. To me, it doesn't even feel real. Like neither the protest nor the police repression, like both of them are, everyone knows what the end game is already. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're just, they're going through the motions. Yeah, I remember there's a really great chapter. I don't know how people feel about Mark Fisher. I know that he kind of like sometimes good, sometimes not, but there's a really great thing where he talks about this in, cap, uh, what is it, Capitalist Realism, where he discusses the fact that in the UK, all protests have basically become like a show. Like everybody knew how they were going to turn out. The pageant. Knowing of like, why are we even doing this at this point? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Pierre Luca. Hi there. Hi, Josh. Thank you very much for your readings and um, for your analysis. Uh, I, it's since our last meeting that I'm thinking about this passage of um, Tikkun's um, introduction to the civil war. Mm -hmm. uh, because I remember that uh, Gustavo was uh, again, um, you know, presenting this problem of what do we do? Like how, what is our goal? What, how do we intervene? And that looks to me always like the, the problem of, you know, the head and the problem of putting together many people uh, in kind of Leviathan uh, fashion to under the same head, within the same head. And this, um, this passage was interesting to me because they say, how is it to be done? Uh, the question is how, not what, uh, but how. And, and, and I thought that, that this could be um, quite, then correct me if, if I'm wrong or if you think um, otherwise, um, it's quite um, applicable to the issue of um, establishing the difference between um, a myth as a form of codification that, um, as you said, um, you know, uh, myths being real, but also at the same time being not real for writing. Uh, it's because a, a myth as a, as a codification is, has a quasi-causal power. And opposing that quasi-causal power that, that causes a, an homogenization and gives directions. And at the end of the day, um, constitutes also protests in England as a specific thing to do according to specific um, uh, patterns of behaviors. This is opposed to, uh, if we want to use some, some another term, so to, to self-organization and to styles of living. So what do you think uh, this text by Patai and, and in general um, is, is taught um, how does it relate to this, this idea of spontaneity as um, self-organization uh, and as styles of living rather than 
um, attacking a specific target um, with with collectively decided uh, tactics. You know, I don't know. I'm just a bunch of ideas. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think the difference between something like this and, and what I'd read from Takun, which although I don't agree with their politics, I, I enjoy, I enjoy quite a bit. And uh, I think I agreed much more earlier in my life, but so think of the idea of conspiracy. So there the two definitions of conspiracy and there, there would be the first, which is almost a, a secret malicious planning of something unlawful, right? But then it can also be harmonious cooperation towards an end. Like they're two very contradictory uh, ways to frame conspiracy. Yeah, that reminded me of uh, Bifo's book uh, about, um, you know, breathing together. Mm -hmm. um, it's the book that he, that he wrote after the first uh, killing uh, by choking uh, mm -hmm. of a black American uh, by the police. Yeah. So when you think about a conspiracy, it's necessarily opposed to consensus truth because it involves a transgression and it involves a, a type of secrecy. So a conspiracy can never be recognized uh, by the power it opposes as legitimate because it's going to be seen as false. That's the, that's the point of it, is that the, the, the core of a conspiracy will always be seen as, from the other side as false, which means it's not coherent. And I think that in, in what Bataille's moving towards with the sacred conspiracy, the reason there's the, the mythology around it and the uh, religiosity around it is that further obscures it from being viewed in any political light, right? So it takes it off the entire playing field. Uh, and similar, like when you think about Tikkun, I don't recall if it's in the same text. I wanna say it's actually in Theory of Bloom that they talk quite a bit about how when you uh, say that you're analyzing political action and specifically political violence, that the most dangerous type of violence to any system of power uh, is random acts of violence, unexplainable violence. So once you, once you have your political project and once you've strategically proposed your rational point of attack, and once you've come to a consensus that makes sense reasonably to everyone to go about and carry that attack out, it's obviously going to be coherent. It's obviously going to be explainable and contextualized within, within the greater struggle. Uh, and that actually takes some of its power because it doesn't, power doesn't fear anything. That if power can understand something, it doesn't fear it, right? Because it can create a solution for it. Whereas, you know, what, what, what Bataille, in, in my opinion, Bataille is saying is if we can create something new that's only intelligible to us, which is why it's secret and why it's conspiratorial, then it has a power. Like that gives it a power because it's, it's not going to be contextualized or it's not gonna be rationalized by what it, what it opposes in a way that it can be recuperated. And I think that's in general, the power of mythology. Uh, so if, if we recognize, uh, and, and I take this from a very nihilist perspective, I say everything, all existence that has no meaning, right? Words have no meaning, but what are uh, a priori, you know, placed into them. But you and I can speak very clearly in symbols because we can both understand symbols because symbols can be recognized metaphorically, right? Like think of uh, like structuralism and Barthes. Like, so we can say symbols can be recognized metaphorically at some meta level, even if we can't communicate directly. And I think that's the level that Bataille is communicating here. Thank you, Josh. Um, you've been way clearer than I was and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Sure. I want, to, I want to jump in really quickly and just mention a few um, intellectual history details. I don't know how helpful they're going to be, but they might sort of um, add some depth to our readings as well. And this is from that book that I had mentioned earlier, the recent translation of some sacred conspiracy documents, as well as just a collection of some things that have been translated for, for quite a while. And it's from the one of the introductory es essays from a scholar named Alastair Brucci. Uh, and... Um, sort of thinking through the basic ideas of the College of Sociology, which is what was created after Ossifal, but they're still very much thinking within the, the notion of Ossifal. And I think that Durkheim is a really important figure to think here. One of the, you know, with at least within the European tradition, 
thought of as one of the three founding figures of sociology, along with uh, Max Weber and uh, Karl Marx. And, uh, you know, Ossifal and the college uh, quite um, expressly said that they, you know, followed Durkheim. Um, one of the most important sort of Durkheimians that we're sort of still using today within this tradition of thought is uh, Marcel Mauss, uh, whose theories of the gift and exchange are incredibly important. And one just sort of background thing here is that um, here sociology looks a lot like what we might call anthropology as well, where it's more interested in sort of like how human groups work as a whole. And it's not interested so much on firm structures or things that are really fixed, but things that sort of shift and transform and that can maybe even have a historical way of shifting and moving almost in sort of like, I don't know, a historical materialist way or something like that. Um, and note that like the gift and exchange and all of this becomes very important. Like for instance, in DUG's third chapter of Anti-Oedipus, in which they actually pose Bataille against um, Levi-Strauss. So they use him to critique it within an anthropological framework in addition to the sort of psychoanalytic ones. Anyway, so um, Brochi says that there are three important concepts to note. Three, uh, the first is social facts. The second is collective representation. And the third is religion and the sacred. And just sort of like quickly summarizing what he says in social fact, he says, uh, Durkheim's basic unit of analysis is the social facts, which quote, is something that is, uh, which is the creation attribute of a social group rather than individual. So although individuals have deep influence on them. Okay, so, you know, looking at social facts. So it's not so much the sort of, um, I don't know, positivist or even liberal way of thinking about that. You know, groups of individuals come together and through some sort of like um, compromise, you know, they vote something into existence and that at its root, it's just, you know, the operations or practices of those sort of groups of individuals, which, which is how like, I don't know, Republican democracy tends to sort of think of itself. It's not that, right? So it's the social fact, it's something that's somehow separate or uh, trans individual that is sort of created by them as a social fact. And then he says collective representations. He says the social facts coalesce into collective representations around specific totems or symbols such as material objects, narratives or allegories, which are quote, the product of a vast collective effort and the accumulation of generations of experience and knowledge. And then once again, he says that they often become sort of autonomous rather like a meme. So even if there's someone who created it, it starts to circulate beyond and outside of that person and beyond their control that are quote, the luxuriant growth of myths and legends a theogenic and cosmological systems. So we're already starting to understand sort of sacred and conspiracy within this framework. So then when we get to religion and the sacred, then says that for Durkheim, religions are, and, and for Dumazil, I mean, not Dumazil, uh, Bataille, um, can be an object of study because they're what binds society or groups together. And so that would lead someone like Bataille to say something like the idea of society is the soul of religion. And so for here, I think it's really interesting where the idea of the sacred conspiracy then is not to say that myths are something that need to be um, disputed with truth in order for them to fall away as if when people held truth and suddenly the power of myth ceased. And instead it saw myths as these things that, well, not necessarily like controlling in like a mind control sense, like myths often are the operative force in a society rather than individual subjects with their like willpower or something, which would be more like, I don't know, the Rousseauian approach that like Gramscians really like. And so it's not about getting people together in an organization where they vote and create a collective will, which would be much a, a, sort of like a traditional socialist or even political approach to things. But instead, the sacred conspiracy is this attempt to conspiratorially create new and different myths that then put forward a new society, as it were. And it's not necessarily society in a repressive sense, but it's an idea that if one wants to sort of make change or transformation, if one you know believes in his best in this, which I, I believe Osfall very much is, then it's uh, the idea is to create new myths rather than to get people together on the streets and you know, in their sort of union, they'll sort of um, create something different. And so I think that's what's so 
interesting about this because it's just like a huge myth-making process then. And that's the sort of project. It's to say, what are new and different and compelling myths? What's the politics of myth? Rather than to say, what's the falsity of myth or what's the thing that we need to sort of dispel about myth? There are all kinds of people who've done this in you know, obviously fucked up ways. The fascists, of course, were who they were most oriented towards with Ossifal. They said, these are myths that we need to get rid of. But I just want to draw everyone's attention to one other myth very briefly that I think just you know, needs absolute mention. So I'm sort of sharing a screen here. I'm showing you the frontispiece to Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. This is maybe very common that, that many of you have seen before. You know, the frontispiece, you know, especially with earlier print publications, is a thing that is often an inside leaf cover, or it's like one of the first few pages. And, you know, okay, so there's the title information in the bottom half with a lot of interesting symbols that have um, deep symbolic importance, such as the crown or um, crossed arms and flags at war and actual people at war. It notes the date of its publication, 1651. So this is you know, quite foundational within the establishing of the modern European, early modern uh, European nation state. But then when you look at the Leviathan himself, who's wearing a crown, so he is the king, or he is even the nation. Um, upon closer examination, the body of the sovereign is a group of individuals. And so this is precisely the sort of political myth that we still uh, we, we live with today within the modern nation state, which is that a state is the product of a nation of people who have come together. And then they have given themselves to create the body of the king. So it's not so much that the king possesses these people within their body, but they themselves have willfully come together to create the body for which we have the head of the king. And so then, you know, many centuries later, we have this question, you know, initially thought through Bataille and Asifal and these other groups, but then brought up by like Foucault, even, you know, half a century later, where he says, even with the, you know, French Revolution, we have still not yet cut the head off the king. And so the idea here is, um, I love the, the psychoanalytic sense, getting rid of the head. The head is this sort of known entity that controls everything, sort of rational self. But there's also the sovereign self, the idea that politics is controlled by a single entity or a single entity that brings everything together in unity. And what does it mean to get rid of that head? And I put a number of the Masson um, images uh, from Sacred Conspiracy that were just like collected from various places, including some of the Oswald journals. Um, and some of it is the body, you know, with the dagger and engaged in ritual or practice, but then also the importance is the heart or the chest, but it's not a collection of individuals anymore. And so if I was to do a close reading of this, you know, there's the guts, but the, there's also the skull over the, the groin, um, and there's the heart and the hand. So I wonder sort of where is myth in this, or what are the myths that are being portrayed? What are the symbols that are being proposed specifically by Asifal? And I would say, um, at least on my reading, um, the dagger shows that this is conflict. And so it's not meant to be quietistic, nor is it sort of some sort of devotional practice that is uh, meant to be a withdrawal. You know, it's meant to actually be an, an advance, but a confrontational one. The other side is the heart. I think that that is the motivation through myth where things are meant to sort of grab you. But then we get all these other elements too, where there's the, the nipples been turned into stars. There's almost sort of a crescent. I don't know if it's necessarily um, symbolic over the throat. There are the guts and there's the skull. So I think there's a lot that could be sort of a thought through, imagined, or perhaps in our context, reimagined. If we were to create a new myth in around this idea of a headless entity that still has a body, but it's not the sort of unitary collection of bodies or whatever else, you know, where does it come from? What are the new social facts that are being produced? How does one creatively engage in that? Okay, that's just sort of my uh, uh, thoughts for now. Oh, I just wanted to, to, to go very quickly, but... Um, <clears throat> Thank you, Andrew, for, for summarizing that. And I just wanted to add something about the a mythology here for a sec. 
I was actually trying to come up with a diagram of, uh, I was uh, in my research for this morning, I was looking at uh, Wittgenstein and looking at, you know, um, the idea of language and the idea of what language can produce either an image or uh, some sort of game, like what, what the objectives are or directions or vectors that uh, when we read something or understand we move in that direction. And I started to think about, are we as a people understanding what uh, our contemporary um, tools, how they're operating? So I think when Josh talked about the internet and that we don't have privacy, uh, we can go many layers further and to say that there are algorithms made by group intelligence uh, over the generations that have built these tools that are superseding what we know what they're really doing. So we're making tools to analyze the tools that are making some outcomes and no one really understands the end goal until they make an experiment. So are we the experiment? So did we move from the, the most intelligent person on the planet to understand what's going on in a society versus now we have supercomputers that try to analyze what we think as individuals in relation to as a society. And what would be that new mythology? So when I was looking at uh, the picture that you talked about, you know, I would just think of zeros and ones or, and the bodies floating around those zeros and ones, like, you know, they're intertwined somehow. And, but it seems as though that we, um, we, let's say researchers and governments and funding bodies are manipulating these types of uh, problems into living forever. Is that something that we as a society want is to live forever? Do we always want to, do we want to explore other galaxies? Is that what we want? Uh, someone made that problem. And as a child, I want to go to the stars but we overlook the people dying next to us. So why is that something that we should strive for? <clears throat> so thank you for bringing up the idea of mythology, but I was thinking about, are we actually seeing the same things? So maybe we should think about a new theoretical understanding of the unknowable here. So if the tools are acting on us supposedly in an intelligent way, and they're learning from all the data, including the pictures that we see here, they can analyze pictures, they can analyze heat maps, everything that's beyond what we as individuals can understand, then what? Um, and I, uh, I think what's really great, thank you, uh, Andrew, for contextualizing it, is, is are we even is a mechanism of, of mythologies now an organizing principle if there's so much data around? So it sounds as though that it's like, uh, it's like we're looking at a, a, and I'm using something traditional, like a painting or some, let's say an alien. An alien comes down and we see little shapes and those shapes we can attach meaning to, but we really don't understand what's happening. Are you saying that we should probably take different parts of those paintings and come together and formulate a response. And I would say the alien here is our tools that are acting independently, but led by certain small groups. Or are we just, or should we just give up and go into our little caves and, and, and just party until we die? Okay. It's, it's really, it's very provocative this week, for sure. But I'm very much into the idea of what do we do? I think accountability for these tool makers that are leading and, and restructuring lives, that should be the first thing we should probably do and find out who these people are. Because legally, if we try to find out, they're hidden under layers and layers and layers. But before we could see the king from the castle, so we could get an arrow and just shoot it at the king. So I think there's much to think about for sure. So thank you. I think you raise an interesting question, Gustavo, which would be like, 
or to sort of ventriloquize Vataya a bit here. How would he respond to this completely new situation we find ourselves in, which is not to say completely, I suppose, but that technology certainly plays a much different role in society now than it did when Bataille was thinking and writing. You know, he was on, he was in the precipice of this era in which would be a great transformation in technology, which is to say World War II, which is where aerial warfare really comes into its own. There's mass bombing. There's also a series of mass death that comes through ultimately the nuclear weapons, which I think would be a paradigm shift in how we have to sort of imagine ourselves and the capacity for you know, a small group of people to kill most um, humans on earth pretty quickly and perhaps even uh, through an accident or un unintentionally. Um, and this was all sort of before Bataille could really sort of figure all this out. And so I think that Bataille's response would be, at, at least the way I read him, he would say, yes, there are these tools that sort of once they're made, who knows where they're gonna go. And one could try and regulate or make people accountable, but it will fail. Not even worth our time to try and do that, or at least not worth his time at least. And the response he would propose would be to say, well, if there's this, these series of myths and dirty tricks and unexpected things that people are doing, that means that they work. And so we should do them as well, but to different ends. And I think that's what's interesting about the sacred conspiracy. It says, don't try and regulate people to bring them back to some sort of moral center. It says, if people have come up with a new paradigm that from the perspective of very conventional mainstream society seems different, scary, mixture of exciting, but also um, worrisome. He says they're on to something. It means that we need to do it, but in a different way that meets our ends rather than theirs. Um, that strategy can be scary to many people because they're worried, well, what happens when we try to use the dirty tricks? Doesn't that simply make us into the fascists or whatever? Which is precisely what Asafal was interested in. They saw esoteric, um, ways of thinking being used by fascism. You know, you watch a History Channel show and you'll see an endless fascination with the esoteric myths of the Nazis. And uh, Bataille and all the other groups, uh, people in the group were like, hey, <laughs> this is really interesting. What if we can find a non or even anti-fascist way to do precisely the same thing, but to different ends? within a sort of avant-garde surrealist or post-surrealist sort of tradition. So that's what I think is so provocative here. I think it's to say, in, in response to dirty tricks, we, we need more, we need better, we need different. Um, and so in part, this conversation, I think sometimes is a practical one then too. It's to say, what are the dirty tricks that you see operating right now and what are the ones that we want? What are ones that we're gonna use? What are the ones that are part of our arsenal? So we can have this sort of meta conversation about it, but I'm also genuinely interested just in, in the practical ones as well. Yeah, I, had, I was gonna kind of maybe, can everyone hear me okay? Um, riff off uh, what you're saying, Andrew, and also maybe try and think through um, some of the things that people have said. Thanks so much, Josh, and everyone for your insights. I always learn so much and feel very humbled. Um, so bear with me as I work through this solar anus. No. Um, one of the things that resonated with me, so to speak, beyond solar anuses is the, uh, the quote, uh, the world to which we have belonged, uh, the world to which we have belonged offers nothing to love outside of each individual insufficiency. Its existence is limited to utility which I think this is the question that's coming up now, this question of utility, um, because I think there's, there is this idea of like how to, yeah, like fuck with or reappropriate or like kind of exist outside of these kind of sense-making, myth-making kind of apparatuses. But also 
the I'm trying to think of like the very way in which we think about like the causality of like action and like the the idea of means and ends themselves like how to even like how to, and I think Josh is getting at this too, like how, to, how does this become like a strategy in itself? So not just that we need new utilities or new ends, but like the very idea of an end is, the, is part of the myth, right? That if you do something and it leads to this end or that we can kind of control that, that um, relationship. And I'm thinking so much here of, you know, these, these kind of like re reference back to things like climate change or action in terms of like ecological things where, um, there's a reliance on a certain myth even about like what the rational life form is or that I like Claire Colbert's kind of take on this idea of like the head, I guess, in terms of like ecological uh, discourse where she says things like, uh, it's once humans think of themselves as a life form and then as a life form with the exceptional capacity of thinking or reason, it becomes possible that the potentiality for thinking could cease to be. Um, Sorry, and that such a non-being of thinking is what must be averted at all costs and without question. And she positions this in the, in the question of extinction, which I know people are raising in, in maybe different, different ways as kind of like to what end, um, and especially when we're faced with like a, you know, planetary kind of transformations. And so there's something here, I think, about this idea of rationality and the rationality of the myth that I think is key. And of course, you know, I think of Deleuze and Guattari's work here around capitalism and, you know, how it's completely rational things are completely rational within the irrational kind of uh, logic of something like capital um, and so how it's not that we need a different rationality I don't know but I'm curious what people think about that because there is this kind of push towards a neo-rational kind of uh, way of thinking about like objective relations in the world but that yeah, that the question of reason, reason, I think is an interesting way to put it too, because maybe it reframes utility, like the reason, the, the raison, um, there's something maybe there that becomes like messy and interesting to play with tactically, like as you're asking, like Andrew, what are the, what are the dirty tricks, or maybe we can think of even other ways to, to think of it. So for me, I'm really interested in pedagogy and teaching. So the, this article is fascinating to me, because I think this, it gets at some of this questions I have around the like way in which education mythologizes existence in all sorts of ways, which is right now mainly in North America oriented towards work. This is why you go to school um, most, most, in most cases and to become a good citizen, which means that you work in certain ways. So I've been trying to play with ideas around a, a, what I call a weird pedagogy, which does things like how you working at not working, um, uh, thinking through that with students, but thinking through a different kind of sustainability with that because it requires a different, we can't think our way out of it, <laughs> which is what schools I think are framed as, like where we, we accumulate knowledge about things and therefore can act better or differently. And so there's there's a question of, of how um, maybe to think through how we encounter the world in terms of desire and affect and those kinds of things, but also I think in terms of like letting go of control, <laughs> which I know I struggle with in a personal, in a personal, just like everyday situation. Again, eating, shitting, fucking, whatever. Like there's, these are things that are, that are so close to us. So I, what resonated with me, Josh, with your kind of initial setup was this, these solidarities happen at the level of the body, right? In ways that are, you know, um, at the level of energy uh, that then we go on Zoom and talk about through these, these inadequate uh, infrastructures, but there's something else that, it, that, doesn't, um, that doesn't get captured. Maybe that's the hopeful, that's, I'll leave on a hopeful note there. Anyways, also lots of ideas. Thanks for listening um, and for the great conversation. Uh, Jesse, I just wanted to say something real quick. Thank you very much. Um, Josh, maybe, and Andrew, you can comment about the idea of time, because time is also a social construct, as I understand it. At some point, we all lived outside of time, and then uh, I think it was an engineering solution that we all came up that we were in time. So how does the role of time here play? Because there was a before, and there is a, a during, but what does the new technology do to the after? Like, it seems like different tools make us lose track of time once again. So can you please comment on that? I, I've got a bunch to say on that, but really quick to uh, 
thank you, Jesse. And it's it's funny that the whole idea of education being mythological and how we have this discussion about myth is if it's something outside of the real or it's almost something of less value. And I thought somebody commented in the chat, it was really interesting about Bolsonaro in Brazil and the use of the myth by the right. The right, I mean, fascists have always used the myth to, to just great effect. And for us to think that we're somehow, you know, different as humans and, you know, more rational and reasonable. And, you know, that that's why, you know, we have better solutions uh, to not really strongly question that would seem kind of silly to me. Like this idea of what's a dirty trick. There are no dirty tricks. There's only dirty tricks if you decide that they're dirty. And I, I think that's, uh, <laughs> we're obviously very mythological minded if, uh, if we don't see that to be the case. We're a bunch of moralists. Um, but it's funny, speaking of fascists, I, I don't consider him a fascist, but I, this whole discussion made me think of Ernst Jünger. And there's a, a very brief quote from the Forest Passage where he says, and this is, this is discussing myth versus, you know, the political or the real. Myth is not prehistory. It is timeless reality, which repeats itself in history. So the whole idea that, to your question of time, Gustavo, it's like the, the myth is the kernel of the real that actually stays with us always which is why the myths repeat themselves. So think of the earliest creation myths. Ultimately, what we, to, what we do today with science is no different than those earlier myths. We don't have any more true solutions. We don't approach some sort of like noumenal reality by examining things. Uh, and it's funny because I, I do think that like the data is highly religious in my mind. Um, I think that science is incredibly theological. And I think that a lot of scientists agree with that if you spend time reading scientists. And uh, we were just reading uh, Foy Robin the other day in, uh, in, in our reading group, and, and he definitely gets deeply into that. Uh, because without our mythological framing, we can't ask the questions to be answered in the first place. So anything that we look for, of course, we're going to find it because that's what we're looking for. If we didn't look for it, it wouldn't be there. So to see as any scientific discovery is anything more than a construct, that's again placing ourselves in this rational view that I think is that's the bullshit view. <laughs> the extinction question isn't a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And if we think that human beings are going to live eternally on earth in some sort of a blissful state because I put my recycling in the right bin and, you know, whatever, uh, to me that's totally nonsensical and far more religious minded uh, than. Than, than frankly, you know, people that, that I would judge as being overly religious. So. As a, as a media and technology scholar, I think it's interesting to even wonder like what is data? Where does it come from? Why do we put belief in it? Just not to say that there isn't a systematicity to science, like there's a sort of rigor to it and it follows its own sort of procedures as truth and there are things that it's able to do because it follows its own procedures and it is verifiable and repeatable and all these things, but it can't, can't do everything. And there are certain forms of knowledge that exist outside science that are just as, if not even more powerful than that. Um, statistics, for instance, which is a form of reasoning through numbers itself comes, I mean, it's even precisely in its name, statistics came from forms of statecraft in which it saw that shifting away from monotheistic justifications for the legitimacy of power and it, knowledge in how to govern is replaced by a notion of quantitative approaches to under, thinking that they would be useful. And you know, more or less it starts happening in the 17th century in Europe. Um, certainly things were sort of counted and cataloged before then, but everything that we know is modern statistics that now seems to be at the heart of public policy, which is probably 90% of what the federal government does and thinks, if not more, is only a few hundred years old. Um, and it's not to say that it's invalid or it's fake or that it doesn't exist, but it's to say that it is a system that has created its own way of counting what is and is not a fact, it, it, it works precisely because it's able to get belief from people. And it is absolutely unhelpful when people like, um, I don't know, uh, Carl Sagan, whoever says, you know, 
you know, science doesn't care about whether you believe in it or not. And then, you know, it's precisely the opposite. Science only works because people believe in it and then enact things in the world based on these truth procedures. It's not to say that they're false, but I think that there's a social context in which all of these things sort of operate. And so I'm absolutely um, in the realm of saying that so much of, let's say the left, I mean, I don't really call myself a leftist, but let's say, you know, the left um, gave up on myth a long time ago, or the forms of myth that it has are silly cults of personality around technocrats and other sort of bureaucratic figures. And so it means that for many of us, you know, the, the left has no future in which we really exist. You know, what does it see art as? It sees art as beautification projects or a more superior form of human communication that need to be paired with, you know, the CDC's policy goals or whatever doesn't see art in the way in which, you know, Bataille and the avant-garde did, which was to completely disrupt our ways of seeing the world in order to pose problems rather than solutions in a way for like the Russian avant-garde to jokingly say that they wanted to blow up the sun. Like none of these things sort of exist on the agenda of what art or aesthetics are or should be anymore. And so for me, I mean, like, I'm, I don't believe in modernity, let's say, but I'm an aesthetic modernist. I really think these ideas of novelty, of disruption, of subversion, like they're, I think, even more pressing now than they ever have been because so many people have bought into sort of like post ideological way where they think that there's just sort of truth that's out there that's gonna lead them to some sort of solution. Um, it's already 1024. Um, we haven't discussed the other text yet. so. Um, Jesse, I know you have your hand up, but maybe we want to also move on to the, the Laura writing. Is Jesse going to say something or are we going to Laura writing? Oh, oh I don't mind. Yeah, I can. <laughs> you go ahead, Josh. Sorry. I, I, just, I put my hand down. So. Oh, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> So the writing is super, super short. It's the piece, the myth. It's not even four pages, kind of like the other one. Um, and it's extraordinarily straightforward. I, I'm guessing that everybody kind of got the gist of it pretty quickly. Um, the first few lines, uh, when the baby is born, there's no place to put it. It's born, it will in time die. Therefore, there's no sense in enlarging the world by so many miles and minutes for its accommodation. Uh, I just, I love that. Like that, that's just, it's, it's such a concise uh, way of, of kind of explaining the absurdity of, of our current view of things. Um, and to take it beyond even the sense of humans in a more material way, when I think about, you know, the environment, uh, lower writing breaks through a lot of dualisms. And so let's think of the, you know, like the man nature dualism here, the, the human natural world uh, or the technology even more so like the, the, the technology natural world kind of uh, dualism. There's nothing on this earth that didn't exist, you know, prior to our arrival. And it's all going to be subsumed right back into the earth whenever we're gone or long afterwards. Uh, so the, the creation of that distinction between the two is almost irrelevant in terms of the earth. Or back to Gustavo, you were talking about time on a long enough timeline. Uh, the planet's really not feeling like it's in an ex existential crisis. Uh, you know, we may be gone in the blink of an eye, but it's not as if the planet really gives a shit about us, unfortunately, as much as we'd like to think that it does. Um, and so for us to believe that, that we somehow need to manipulate it, or even more so, it's, it's embarrassing to say we need to save the planet. And that's the most cystic comment you can possibly make about humankind, that we should save the planet. Um, going ahead with this, uh, it, and here comes the, the, the relig uh, religiosity part of it. As it's not one baby, but all babies which are laid upon this altar, it becomes the religious duty of each to keep on pretending for the sake of all the others, not for himself. Uh, I can certainly relate this to ideas of public health. Uh, we, we can relate this, I think that's the easiest way. Like if we wanna think about uh, like Foucault and biopolitics, that's a pretty direct line to draw. Um, it's been rather curious to hear that there were inside discussions uh, pre-pandemic as the pandemic was just starting that governments were getting ready to propose lockdowns and very uncertain about whether we'd follow along so well. 
And they were actually, you know, shocked and rather delighted that everybody just locked themselves in their homes and, you know, sucked it up. Because if at the drop of a hat, uh, we can get entire populations to lock themselves indoors and stay put. I, I would say that's a pretty strong statement of our belief in the myth. Even the more rebellious of us, I suppose. So further, uh, the myth becomes the universal sense of duty, the ethics of abstract neighborliness. Uh, we've talked before about the 99%. Uh, you know, you talk, we've talked many times about identity politics groups or you know, folks that we choose to identify with. Um, take like a, a page out of like Michel Serre in the entire idea of unities and harmonies. It's all construct. Like it's all things that we choose to see as the same. The difference is primary and, and we choose to see the unity in them. So by giving ourselves the, the sense of neighborliness, uh, even if people identify say as leftists or the, the idea of solidarity amongst anarchists, it's ultimately an abstraction may not be helpful in any one situation, but it's something that we grab onto because it provides meaning in, in its mythical character. Another part of this that I love, the idea of impermanence, and we talked about this before. Uh, so in the end, she says, <clears throat> talking about the method, whatever language it uses, it makes up as it goes and immediately forgets. Every time it opens its mouth, it has to start all over again. This is why it remains a baby and dies. Praise be to babyhood, a baby. In the art of not living, one is not ephemerally permanent, but permanently ephemeral. So we don't grab on, like we're not trying to grasp from state to state to state. We don't think that if we move to a different location, we're going to have a different permanent sense of being. We recognize that there's going to be change regardless. That it, it's impossible to escape in our physical circumstances or the movement in time and space. Uh, it is almost irrelevant. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, and if we can let go of that sort of grasping, I was kind of thinking of it to, to bring it back to d &G, like the idea of lines of flight. It's, it's kind of like the hell with lines of flight, like we should teleport because ultimately there, there's no difference. It doesn't have to be a movement through space. It's merely from one to another. That, that transitional period in the middle is really of our own making uh, and kind of like a trick of our cognition so that we can comprehend what we're in, in the process of doing. We have to see the process to understand that a process takes place. And then further down, uh, it talks about like when we, when we create that person, when we make ourselves social, the person too becomes a friend of himself, or we could say a neighbor of himself. He no longer exists. So we actually destroy ourselves uh, for the sake of society. Um, and this can be read a couple different ways. Uh, so writing was not quite a contemporary, but very closely related to uh, Max Stirner, for anyone who's read Stirner. Uh, she's extremely egoistic um, in that she's looking for, in her, in her early poetry especially, she's really focused on uh, communicating like her ineffable self. So she's not trying to give you a literal communication. She's trying to really express of herself. Uh, and I think Gustavo mentioned the introduction to this piece, uh, Anarchism's Not Enough by Lisa Samuels. The introduction is awesome and really gives you like a very powerful, I, I don't know, I'm not always in intros, but she gives a great, really powerful reading of writing in general and some of her key concepts. Um, and writing goes into how as a woman in the early 20th century, she was essentially invisible already. She was on the outside. So think of like uh, Afro-pessimism almost, you know? She's, she's got like some feminist pessimism going on in a big way, but she sees that as her power because then she doesn't have to be mediated. She doesn't have to communicate directly with you or be translated. Uh, she's already outside, which makes it easier for he, her to be that direct conduit. Um, she starts getting bogged down, like in her later works, she takes a big break, like 30 or 40 years, then jumps back into writing later in life. Uh, but it's more along the lines of like linguistics and grasping at that type of direct communication that in her earlier writing, she totally just forgoes it. I think that's the most powerful. Um, but yeah, she, she felt already outside. So she didn't have that desire to attach herself to something in the first place. Uh, and letting that desire go, uh, I, I think that in a lot of ways, that's again, what Bataille is talking about. Uh, forgetting about rationality. Uh, I think that it was Nietzsche who talked about, uh, you know, the, the impossibility of, of like the analogy 
because no one thing is really like the other. So making all of these comparisons, they're, they're not objective statements or subjective statements. Uh, so the power is almost, as writing will say, like between the words, the power is between the meeting. Um, and that's even, you can take it back if you want to go like with the uh, acephala project and anthropology. There's a lot of research that'll say that, you know, pre-linguistics, so much of our communication was like most other species. It was through uh, intonations, right? It was through body language, intonations, volume, all of these different aspects. Um, our appearance, like our physical appearances in every way is part of that uh, body, body language, facial expressions, everything. And still to this day, that's so much of it. So like we have to recognize that even face-to-face -face or even face-to-Zoom, however we're doing this, uh, we get more than just the value of the words, but then you put those words to text and you almost have to like to strip away another layer of literalism and kind of read the, read the words loosely to take them on as yourself if you're gonna get really the value out of it. Yeah, like Andrew said, like saying mean things to your pet in a happy voice, exactly. Or saying nice things to, to uh, you, you know, a, a person you don't care for so much in a nice, <laughs> in, in a nice voice, right? So yeah, I know we don't have a lot of time, so so we can discuss. I think that's about it. That was a that was definitely an easier text with less interpretation involved, for sure. Yeah, thank you so much, Josh. Um, someone I hadn't read yet, and so I'm excited to dig in more. Um, I think that you know, there's this whole period of sort of egoist and nihilist um, writers who really haven't gotten the attention that they deserve, and you know, they cover a social and political spectrum, you know, um, I would say that probably the ones that I'm interested in are the more sort of fighty and, and, and antagonistic ones rather than the sort of, sort of meditative ones. But I think that they're all sort of interesting, you know, like the Russian nihilists or people engaged in Ottentots, you know, who, who sort of like fall out of both the socialist, communist, or even the anarchist spectrum. But anyway, um, one thing that I'm thinking unites all the figures that we've been talking about today is the death of God. So very much writing in a sort of like post Nietzschean moment in which we all very much are at this point where criticism becomes important because criticism isn't something that you do to others to say that they're wrong, but it's also a, a practice that you gauge in yourself to say that perhaps even your own notions or the things you've come to believe are incorrect. And the sort of question of, what do we do in an act of criticism, not just the criticism of God, perhaps not even criticism of larger social or human categories, but even criticisms of um, the self. And so, you know, with Fatai, I think we have someone who wants to sort of say, well, now that we understand that myths come from somewhere, we should engage in our own myth-making process in which we sort of give counter myths or anti-fascist myths or something. And perhaps you could, um, explore this a little bit more for me. From what I got from this reading, it seems like writing and saying, we all believe in this myth, you know, let's not call it ideology because that's what the sort of Marxists would do or something. Um, does it fulfill a similar sort of purpose? And if so, sort of like, is it really poetry? Is that her way through? So this sort of like more meditative and linguistic process and um, is is it myth busting? I don't think so. Is it that, that it, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm interested in just sort of like what, what she poses as her sort of like path through once you recognize that there is a myth and, and what you do with it. And does it, does she imagine that you'd ever live in a world without myth or that at least a person might be sort of uh, demythologized or something? I think that, uh, so writing's using myth to kind of subvert herself in a way. Like, so she's using myth in a subversive sense that obviously she's putting it as not real but then critiquing the real at the same time, like a very Sternerian sort of like, you know, turn of words, a little bit of a joke in there. Um, again, and I'll try to post it or anybody that's listening right now from the study group, I think that we've got it somewhere online, I've got to find it. Uh, but that intro by Lisa Samuels is nice because it breaks down kind of chronologically some of her larger key points of thought. Um, and the way she saw getting past it and she saw poetry as being the vehicle because she felt music, for instance, uh, was trying too hard to, uh, to be emotive. Whereas she feels poetry can really be nothing but, a, but an expression of like your personal self, uh, almost an expression of like, it's like speaking in tongues, you know? Like it's coming from, it's coming from you, it's unmediated. Um, 
but contrary to uh, to say, you know, Deleuze and Guattari, she didn't see becoming as being the goal. It was unbecoming. And I, I love this idea because she takes life. And so if we think of our lives in a human sense, we have like this vital energy within us and it grows to a point, but then it's just decay. So life is about for her expenditure, not creation. So tie into Bataille, like with the, the idea of uh, excrement, right? Because as we're living, we feel like we're building something when in fact, we're just destroying ourselves. Our bodies are breaking down constantly. It's not as if they're getting greater and then we die. They're actually breaking down throughout the process. So Laura Riding was very much into acting. I mean, she was pretty wild. She threw herself out of a window over a bad relationship, uh, you know, somehow, you know, relatively unscathed, uh, moved all over the world, like on a whim, just, she was, she was rowdy uh, in relation again to, uh, to folks like, uh, you know, Stirner and in some way Nietzsche, who were these really bombastic men who had these, you know, big personalities and they write very loud things. But in life, they were both like somewhat meek individuals, you know, and somewhat frail too. So writing kind of the opposite. Um, she's, she's more of like the, you know, she speaks quietly, but carries the big sticks sort of a thing. Um, but that unbecoming as it happens, it, that's, how, that's how you get to whatever the real is within you, or as she calls the individual unreal. So it's the opposite. Uh, she posits that the only thing that's productive is productive waste. Because in trying to create, then you have to prefigure. And almost in the, again, a Lacanian sense here, right? Like think about a desire in, in the Lacanian sense, not a Deleuzean sense, but in the Lacanian sense, that prefiguration destines you to failure because you're never going to actually reach, you know, the idea of what you have in your mind. You draw up the blueprints, you build the blueprints, but it's still not what you really wanted. So then you've got to go and do the process again and again and again. So for her, the idea was design waste. And that's how she saw her poetry it was essentially like a, a designed excrement. Um, her criticism, interestingly enough, so she was very much not nihilistic. She had almost a, a Christian morality about her. And she was very clear and open about that. Uh, she was still, a, you know, somewhat a romantic and a modernist um, at the same time. And her uh, her critique of literary criticism was what it was that it attempted to be objective, and that there should be no systemization. That uh, I, I put in the chat earlier, I, I think the same way me methodology as ideology. Like, there's what's the difference between the two? One is ultimately your belief system too, you put it into practice consistently over time, you, it takes rigidity, it ossifies. Um, and she saw that as the problem. So she felt critique shouldn't be something where at the time it was very scholarly. And you know, it, it, it's like you're, you're doing your thesis or whatever. For her, it wasn't like that. It's that you spew forth whatever this excrement is that you're creating through your decomposition. Uh, and that's your ineffable self and that's where it comes from. So hope that explains it a little bit. And Jesse's got a hand up. Thanks, thanks. That's gonna be my new inspiration to finish my dissertation, just to like get it all out, just get it out. Um, I was, I, some of the things you were saying, Josh, or, or what, I were drawn, what I was drawn to in the text as well. And I just thought um, what you're talking about right now links back to me uh, to the Bataille and this question of exhaustion as well as some of our previous talks and how it's like exhausting to be the head. It's exhausting to kind of uphold certain mythologies. So this is back to the level of the body. It's and the question of like, why do we, you know, fight for our servitude as if it was our, so like it's exhausting to do this, to uphold these things and yet um, they continue. So there's something there about, I think, the practical question of like what might be done and, and, a, and a way of thinking about solidarity around this like collective ex exhaustion that everyone feel, I think is experiencing in different ways. And I don't just mean from like Zoom meetings. I just mean, you know, the, the trouble of being born, like the, um, and so the writing was interesting to me in this question of kind of art. And I liked the, or I was curious about the quote, maybe we can talk about it, um, that this idea that the myth may collapse as a social whole, yet it continues by its own memory of itself to impose itself as an aesthetic whole. So I'm this, I, thinking of your work, Andrew, and what you're just talking about too, these like things don't work. Like it works to certain ends or like data or statistics, they work really well, but they're, they're, they're collapsing also in all sorts of ways, or there's, it has to continue to kind of like um, feed forward in ways to, to maintain the myth, um, which requires a lot of new, very creative 
um, technologies and social relations and forms of work and you know all of this stuff. Uh, but but maybe that myth there's like that aesthetic quality and I don't know writing's work but sounds Josh that this is this is it right the aesthetic like at the level of the body or the ace thesis maybe like the how that is part of upholding the myth, but then it sounds like too also might lead to this line of flight or like some sort of um, exit, even if it's through waste, even if, if it's through this kind of like uh, undermining or something um, as opposed to over-determining, I don't know. But yeah, something about the social and the aesthetic I thought might be interesting, linking back to some of the questions from uh, the before and then, uh, yeah, just curious what thinking about uh, aesthetics. Styles always come back around, right, Andrew? I mean, that could be part of it. The, the aesthetic always comes back, like almost uh, think about eternal recurrence or, or again, repetition from a more Deleuzean perspective that it's always coming back in some new form and we almost don't recognize it, but that kernel, of, like that myth is still there. The core of it's there. And we, we watch new, uh, new movies, we watch new television programs, we hear new songs, we read new books but all the stories are essentially the same. Like if we want to trace them throughout history, they all follow the same storylines. We're attracted to the same archetypes. I mean, that's, I, I think we can view archetypes as more, as more real than real in some ways because we can identify with them so directly. Like we find ourselves inside of archetypes rather than really see a reflection of ourselves in them. Oh no! I was about to say Josh, Joseph Campbell, and uh, you know the uh, you know the, the the archetypes. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. I was reading something on Joseph Campbell just the other day. The, exactly, Gustavo. Exactly. I'm just and so let's see. What's interesting maybe here is like I'm I'm thinking of Guattari's kind of like. Um, ethical aesthetic paradigm like how does this might be a way like I don't like against a certain egoism um, of these writers thinking of these like re-singularizations which are always like I'm curious Josh if you're like this transport or what you said not the line of flight but the teleportation is like a mutant existential territories the alien and there was comments on the alien in the chat like this this very different kind of relationship to the, the outside um, which is a practice and a, therefore maybe a politics, I don't know, but the, aesthetic, the ethical aesthetic, I, I, I'm just thinking there's like an intervention here against the kind of self as some sort of fundamental thing that, or I'm not saying that writing would say that, but you, you know, when, she, when you're talking about this ineffable quality of a self, mm -hmm. as opposed to this kind of like terminal for, I don't know if there's thoughts there around the, that distinction. I use the word teleport kind of, I, I guess ironically, because I guess I would reject the inside outside dualism personally. And I think that's what this is really trying to get to is that there's, there's no place to go to, like there's nowhere else to go. Um, we have to act from where we are and not necessarily in an egoist or like a individualist sense. Like we don't have to be, well, take Ernst Jünger, for example, like we don't have to be the anarch necessarily. Uh, but we do have to act from where we are and to think that something different will occur if we go to somewhere else like then we're already caught up in the logic trap like then we've already fallen into you, you know what we've been told so the creation like the creation of the aesthetic and the creation of the mythology is i guess that's where i see my best options partly because um i suppose people that know me would probably say that i'm very nihilistic um I don't see any ethics aside from like ethics are all ultimately preference. Like if we think about the choices that we make, um, we, we can attach them to all kinds of like exterior structures and ways of belief. But ultimately when we act, like we are acting on preference, like we're acting on aesthetics in a certain sense. It's, it's what we would prefer to something else. Um, I can choose to see fascist is evil <laughs> but but again that's that's my preferential and that's that's my mythological position that i'm taking to posit my system versus their system uh and they may equally see the opposite i may equally be the enemy uh, and i think that by recognizing that then we can like the recognition is what removes the dualism 
like the recognition that there isn't some unifying meaning, there's not some harmony. This may be very off base, but one thing that I just couldn't help but keep thinking of when I was reading the writing as well, and it's probably not her aim or a goal or anything, but it's like such a fantastic criticism or at least like unpacking of a certain version of Heidegger that says that really sort of like a big part of meditation and humans is our finitude, which is to say our limits, but also in particular, our understanding of our own existence in relationship to our death. And I think that it becomes a sort of cliche in bad Heideggerian writing where they're like, well, people have forgotten is death. And once we realize death and suddenly everything sort of clicks into place. Um, because I feel like um, the way that they do it just, just like often doesn't um, speak to me in a sort of interesting ways. Like I, I'm certainly no like stranger to thinking about death. I just find that that one has to do it in sort of like interesting and nuanced and elegant ways. And for me, she, she almost sort of like turns this on, on its head, you know, cause there's this classic Heideggerian notion of like, we're brought into existence against our own free will. We're sort of thrown into this place and, you know, we know nothing of it. It seems sort of absurd and we're not meant to sort of make something our, of ourselves in the sort of like, I don't know, existentialist sort of live a vibrant life and make the most of, of what you can. You know, I guess Heidegger is more just the sort of aseptic version of it. But writing here is just like, it's just a myth. You don't have to make sense of this. It's, it's not really that important. And you don't have to have kids in order to make your life meaningful. You don't have to reproduce society. You don't have to live for others. You know, all these sort of like ethical obligations that get sort of like put on us because we're afraid of like vulnerability and our own death and like the infinitude, like all these sort of um, ethical paradigms sort of based around that. She's just like, not really. Maybe you write poetry, maybe you don't. <laughs> maybe you live a wild life or a, apparently it's also about like what you waste, what you tear up, <laughs> kind of excrement sort of falls out in the process. And I kind of love that. I think it's beautiful because I think that you know, it's not the part of Batai that we read, it, read this sort of like excess excrement, excessive sort of piece of it. But I think that that's one of the other interesting pieces of him too. And there are ways in which people sort of re-volunteerize it. They're like, well, if it is excrement, how do we figure it out? How do we plan it? How do we do the right excrement? How do we have the right excrement? And suddenly it's not excess at all anymore. It's, it's back in the restricted economy. It's refunctionalizing it and everything. And so, there's something really nice in the writing where she's just like, no, nah, it's all bad. Let's not think too hard about that. Let's figure out something else in the process. Maybe I'm being a little too flip here, but I, I sort of, that's something that came to me as I was, I was reading it. I, I just wanted to uh, maybe add a little bit to that, but um, the passage that painting, sculpture, music, architecture, religion, history, and science are all essentially myth. Uh, you know, I, I was thinking about, uh, you know, I'm a third generation educated as an architect, right? So the mythology is, hey, one person can go and do reimagine the world, right? So that right there is so obviously not true, but it drives you to doing things that are outside of uh, the norm, like uh, self-care would be one thing, right? Capitalism is another idea, we're all gonna be rich. Um, but why am I bringing this up is I'm organizing, uh, I'm one of the organizers to put together a free school of education this summer, and it's two months long of panels, lectures, workshops. And you get to a point where you're just like, hey, education is free and is a human right. But then you get to, we can't really communicate what innovation is because we have to do what others think is acceptable or else this would be meaningless, right? So you, there are different barriers or ways or, 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 or obstacles to really make true innovation. You know, having a discussion is uh, a problem if everyone needs to only give a certain amount of time so that's why I was, uh, I was curious to think about, um, this as a tangent, the idea of the alien. So recently 
I've been hearing a lot about aliens. So as a mythology, Andrew, because <laughs> you posted your article, why? Like, why now? Like, you know, uh, who cares? I mean, so what? Uh, you know, for me, I still think of the problems on earth that are important. You know, if Josh, my neighbor, needed help, I would go and fix and change my life to help my neighbor. But why are we fixated now in the sky? Is it because what Josh said is that we can, they can conveniently say there's a pandemic and we all hide in our, in our places? And now they know that we are totally, uh, we will obey orders. Is that really the objective here? Fear of death equals compliance. I, I, I'm very, um, I'm not saying that I'm cynical, but there, there is something strange about the idea of control now. Like wh what is the purpose of it? <laughs> If you're curious about aliens, I mean, this is a bit of a tangent, but you know, I, I don't think there's any one discourse on aliens. Um, and it's certainly just a different metaphor or allegory for the other. And so it can come in many shapes or forms and different historical moments. It means various things, you know. The 1950s, which is where sort of it becomes really huge in popular culture and people are having UFO sightings and all of that. It's very much about Cold War anxieties and an alien unexplainable other in that way. What's sort of interesting is if you actually watch a lot of alien films as well, there's this liberal um, obsession of this idea that the nations of the, of the world are divided be simply because of misunderstanding or because of prejudice. And so what we really need is an external threat, like in an alien invasion, and people will put all their differences aside and they'll come together. And we still see this in a lot of the prevailing sci scientists trying to do public policy around things like climate change. Like, oh, the people of the world um, disagree on really minor things or they're completely trumped by climate change. We need to put those differences aside and all come together in unity. And climate change is the thing to sort of unify us. And it's funny because this trope has been around for such a long time and it's never, it's never been true. We've never had these external events happen, happen in that way, whether it's nuclear war um, or what. Um, there's also another version of Alien that's m much older and much longer, which is related to frontier myths. It's very much is about an indigenous or a primitive other that can be romanticized in some ways. Ah, uh, they really had it figured out. And unfortunately, modernity has made us lose touch with nature or the natural world or something. So we need to sort of return to some sort of pre-modern state. Or there's also the opposite side of that primitiveness, which is they're trapped. They're behind and, you know, um, they need to catch up because they're trapped in their sort of bad ways of thinking and their mythologies or their cosmologies or whatever. Um, what's interesting is how the alien sort of functions and circulates in a post-Cold War world where conflicts, I don't think, are as clearly defined as they once were in the Cold War, at least for certain parts of the world living in the United States, where there's no specific certain enemy right now. So the alien is much more circulatory it's much more morphic, it's more sort of monstrous. Um, and the alien then is something that's, let's say, unassimilable. You know, the alien might move to your country and live in your midst, but they may never learn your language, they may have different customs, or even if they do, they may harbor some sort of secret idea or ideology that may explode at some moment, some sort of terrorist incident. Um, What's interesting, you know, in art and in other places, people have been thinking and talking about the alien in a productive fashion as well, which is that the alien can also be the thing that is so strange that you could never come to understand it without you changing yourself. And that's what I wrote about. You know, I, I say that, you know, we have notions of the monster, the monstrous, which is where things that we know ourselves are familiar slowly mutate and become ever stranger. That's interesting, you know, okay, we can strangeify ourselves or something like that. But the alien is about an encounter with something so incomprehensible or so different that in fact, it breaks our sense of who we are, our sense of self, 
in order to even have an encounter or a confrontation with it. I think that's a sort of novel way of rethinking like revolution, you know, revolution in a broad sense. Like what would it happen for there to be enough transformation that the world as we know it and its social and political systems of exploitation somehow would end or shift or change in a, in a categorical or significant way. And so I'm interested in a encounter with the alien in that way. And, and it, it, what's fundamental or interesting about it is its destruction of how you currently are too. And that one can have many alien encounters that are just about finding common ground. Like that's what the, what was that Amy, I mean, what's her name film where, you know, there were the weird aliens and she's the translator. Rival. Yeah, arrival, where it's just sort of like finding common ground and cooperation and consensus and all that kind of stuff. I think that's the sort of like silliest version of it because then it's just like, everything's just a problem of miscommunication. You just need better communication technologies and suddenly we'll all sort of come together in one big sort of harmonious whole. And I think that um, maybe on the polar opposite of that, we get the lower writing, which is to say, like in the Lacanian sense, maybe all communication is miscommunication and it's not something that needs to be bridged, nor should it. It's about becoming stranger or increasing your miscommunication or doing better or no miscommunication or something. And that, and that that's, it's vibrant or it's interesting or it's excrement or it's whatever, but that's sort of what we have and that's what we work with. And, and let's not treat it as a problem that needs or could be fixed. It's about that's just a state of the world that we live in and that there are other strategies we should be thinking about. I just have to say, I see uh, Gustavo has some comments on academic freedom and uh, talks about the 1619 project. And I would recommend uh, everybody read the book Dinosaurs and the Story of the Bible. And that should be in school as well. Uh, <laughs> we were reading, uh, Foyer Robin talks about how, you know, he's anti-science. He thinks they should be able to tr teach creationism in school if you want to. So it's, it's funny that like from academia, we'll, we'll push so hard in the direction of like a more liberal reading of history or these alternative narratives to history. Uh, but then s others are completely repulsive and obviously not scientific or rational and worthy of discourse. Uh, whereas I don't think anyone was alive you know, 10 million years ago to really describe the situation or 10,000 years ago or 150 years ago for that matter. Um, but truly uh, it's available very cheap all over the place. And it's a picture book that takes you through uh, a creationist explanation of dinosaurs. And uh, it's, it's now my children's favorite book at the moment. Um, and pretty humorous because they actually ask some questions that would be very challenging to answer given how much right now we're also finding we may have misconstrued the nature of dinosaurs in the first place. Um, but I think that if we wanna be open-minded, we should look in both directions. And, and that goes back to us talking about maybe the left has been blind to mythology through closed-mindedness. And, and in that way, uh, really given up a lot of ground uh, to the right in a political sense. It doesn't interest me, but now that I think about it, like that, that is interesting. Thank you for joining Quiver. For more, visit our website at ourquiver.org, where you can RSVP for future events and see readings. We also ask you to subscribe while you're there to our newsletter. Till later, Quiver. Thank you.